In this video, I'm going to demonstrate why post-processing is a crucial step if you're aiming for photorealism in a 3D render. So of course, photorealism is dependent on a whole bunch of factors, including the quality of your modeling, your shading, your texturing, and your lighting. But post-processing also has an important part to play. And to demonstrate this, I've downloaded some photographs from pexels.com. So let's take a look at them. Because one of the reasons a photograph looks like a photograph is down to the imperfections that are inherent in the medium of photography. And when these imperfections are missing, our renders look like renders rather than photographs. So what specifically are the imperfections I'm talking about? Well, they're all down to minor flaws in the lenses principally. So bright areas of the image are always going to have some glare or bloom, and you can see that clearly in this image. You're going to get some vignetting in the corners. There's also going to be a little bit of softness on the edges. And in the case of this image, there's also some chromatic aberration that you can see here on this lampshade and on these window frames here on the right hand side. And if I zoom into the image, that might be a little bit more obvious. You can see the clear purple fringing here. And if I come over to the other side, you can see we have some purple fringing around here as well. And if you spend some time looking at a variety of photographs, you are going to see these imperfections everywhere. For example, we can clearly see the vignetting here in the corners of this image, as well as the blooming around the windows and the glare around the spotlights. And we can look at a whole series of photographs and we are just going to see these kind of imperfections everywhere. You can clearly see here the glare around these wooden slats, it's slightly obscuring them. Everything looks a little bit hazy in this area. And the same applies here, the blinds are slightly obscured by the glare. And if we carry on looking through photographs, we'll see that the glare and bloom is not just around the windows and the light sources, but you can also see it in the reflections. You can see the glare bleeding into the reflection of the wood. And in this image, we can see glare around the refracted caustics, all of the light sources in this image, and this display cabinet here around this light source in this image, around this curtain. And here in the window, the glare is so strong that you can barely see the details in the blinds. And in the far windows, you can clearly see some more glare. Again, all of the detail here in the curtains is completely obliterated. The same thing happens in this image. Some more visible glare in the left-hand side of this image. And so if you spend some time closely examining photography, you are going to see these effects everywhere. Even when there's no light source directly visible in the image, we still have a little bit of glare around the reflections on this candle. And in this image, we can see the details on the lampshade are being obscured by the glare from the light bulb. Again, there's very visible blooming around this window. You can see this blue haze around the window frame. And the more you look at photographs, the more you're going to see this everywhere. And so you've probably looked at thousands of photographs without ever consciously noticing this. But as soon as it's missing, something feels wrong. And so if you're aiming for photorealism, you need to incorporate some of these optical defects into your renders in order to make them look photographic. So let's switch back to Blender where I've got this interior render. And what I've done is to create a bunch of nodes that allow me to quickly add these kinds of post-processing effects to my renders, either at render time or in post. And so I'm going to quickly demonstrate how they work on this interior. So my node graph in the compositor is currently mostly empty. I have a muted exposure node. And here I've got a split node, which is going to allow me to quickly compare the before and after states of my post-processing. Now, the first thing I want to do is to enhance the local contrast in the image. And in Photoshop, I have a very neat trick to do this, which is to use the Unsharp Mask filter with a very low value, but a very wide radius. Let me just quickly switch to Photoshop to demonstrate this. So here I have a slightly different version of this render. And if I go to Filter, Sharpen, Unsharp Mask, you can see that here we have the traditional Unsharp Mask with the amount set to 100 and the radius set to 1. But instead of doing this, what I'm going to do is reduce the amount all the way down to 20, but increase the radius to 30. And let me just click OK. And if I hit Control Z to undo that and Control Shift Z to redo that, can you see what's happening? We don't really have traditional sharpening. You'll see if I zoom in, we don't have those sharp edges that we'd normally get from the unsharp mask filter. 
But what we do have is some enhancement of the local contrast of the image. You can see as I undo and redo the effect that the unsharp mask with the wide radius is just giving me a little bit of extra contrast and punch in the render. And so what I've done is to recreate this effect in Blender, which was actually a little bit tricky because Blender doesn't come with a sharpened filter that lets you control the radius. And so I've had to build my own unsharp mask filter, which I've saved as a node group preset. So I'm just going to pan my workspace this way. I hit Shift A and in the groups, I'm going to select local contrast enhancement and I'm just going to drop it here on this noodle. Then I'll zoom in on the node to take a look at the values. So I'll need to increase the size to 20 and I might increase the strength to 1.5. And now if I hit M to mute and unmute the node, you can see the effect that it's having on our render. Next, I'm going to add an exposure node. So I hit Shift A and search for exposure. I'm going to drop that just before the local contrast and let's increase the exposure to say 0.3. Then I'd like to add an S curve for some additional punch and contrast. So I hit Shift A and look in the groups. Let's locate the S curve and just drop it right here. And in order for this to work, I'll need to connect the image to both the value slots in the node. So by default, with the factor set at one, it's a little bit too strong. I'm going to reduce that down to 0.3. And let me just select the node and mute it and unmute it. And you can see what it's doing. It's just adding some additional contrast. But what's really nice about this is that it preserves all of the detail in both the highlights and the shadows. And this will allow me to bump the exposure up a little bit more. So I'll try 0.5 and I'll come over to the S curve and I'm going to set its fat to, to 0.4. And if I tab into the group, we can take a look at the curve and I can explain exactly what's going on. So this curve is currently only being applied to the luminosity of the image. It's not affecting the color. And the way that a curve works is that the steeper the angle, the more contrast is being added. And so we have a lot of contrast here with this steep curve in the midtones. But as we come to the highlights and the shadows, the curve becomes more shallow. And that means that we preserve the detail in both those areas of the image. So I'll tab back to my main node graph. And next, we're going to add the most important node of all, which is the glare. So I hit Shift A and in my groups, I've got a custom glare node, which I'm going to drop here. And as you can see, that instantly adds glare to the bright parts of my image. And if I zoom in on this area and select the node and hit M to mute it, you can see that this looks really digital. And if you were examining this, you might think, well, what's wrong? My modeling's fine. My shading seems fine. The stools are too far away for the detail and the texturing to be an issue. And it's simply because they're backlit behind this bright window and without the glare, it just does not look real. Whereas as soon as I enable the glare, this starts looking much more photographic. And that's simply because as per our photo reference, when you have a bright backlit object, you really are expecting to see glare. And if it's missing, something just feels off. Next, I'm going to add a little bit of edge softness so that the edges of the frame are not quite as sharp as the center. So I hit Shift A and in my groups, I've got an edge softness node, which I'm just going to drop here. And let's zoom in on the image once again, just so we can see what's going on. I'm going to increase this value to five. And you can see as I do that, all the details just around the edges of the image become more blurry. If I really exaggerate this and set it to 10, it's going to be more obvious. But that is a little bit too strong for me. So I'm going to set it back to five and let's just zoom out and take a look. Now, looking at the plant on the left hand side, I think five might be a tad too strong still. So I'm going to set it to four. But just keep an eye on this detail as I mute and unmute the node. You see, before I apply the effect, everything is just too sharp and too even. The sharpness in the whole frame is the same everywhere. Even though I've got depth of field enabled, as you can see with the out of focus background. But when I enable this node, you can see we get some visible edge softness. And to me, that just makes it look a little bit more photographic. And that's partly because when the effect isn't active, I just think this looks a little bit too digital. Whereas with the effect active, it just has more of the feel of a photograph. Now you can also take this effect a little bit further with some chromatic aberration, which I'm not going to do in this case, but that is an option that you do have. And next I'm going to hit Shift A once again. And the final effect we're going to add is some vignetting. I'll need to increase the strength of the effect. So let's try setting it to 10. That's obviously way too strong. Let's try setting it to say three. And now if I mute the node and unmute it, you can see the effect is probably a little bit too subtle. So let's try setting it to four, which I think is probably just about right. And clearly see the effect of the vignetting. 
and when I disable it, there is a difference. And one of the nice things about vignetting is that it really helps to draw the eye into the image. So now that I've done my post-processing, I'm just going to select this exposure node and unmute it. And let's come over to my split node. And if I unmute this node, we can compare the before, which is here, to the after. And so as you can see, what I've done is actually relatively subtle. You can't be heavy handed with your post-processing, otherwise it's just going to look overdone and a little bit cheesy. But if you do it carefully and cautiously, you're just gonna add a little something to your renders that's really gonna help to make them look more photographic. And so with the post-processing disabled, you can see everything looks a little bit flat, maybe even a little bit hazy. Everything is just too evenly sharp and the lighting is also too even. Whereas when I enable the post-processing, we get a little bit more punch, a little bit more contrast, much more variation in the sharpness and softness of the image. And crucially, we get the glare around the bright windows. And overall, we just have a more photographic look. And so if you'd like to incorporate these effects in your work, these nodes that are created are freely available. There's a link in the description where you can go and download them to use them in your own projects. And I've also created a completely free tutorial where I go into more depth about how I built these nodes so that you can recreate these effects yourself in your own work. And by following along with this tutorial, you'll get a much greater understanding of why these optical effects are important and how to build them yourself for use in your own work. So if you'd like to know more, just click on the link in the description to download my post-processing nodes and the free training on how you can recreate them yourself. And before wrapping up, here is a different render where I've applied the same set of processing nodes. And if I enable the post-processing, this is the before and this is after. And you can see that once again, the post-processing is quite subtle, but when it's disabled, you can see the overall look is a little bit flatter, less interesting. Whereas with the post-processing enabled, we get a more contrasty, interesting and photographic end result. So if you'd like to find out more about this process, be sure to click the link in the description.